Hello and welcome to AGI's GeoWebinar series. My name is Leila Gonzalez and I'll be moderating today's GeoConnection webinar, Canadian Exploration, High Demands for the Future Workforce. This webinar was co-organized by the Mining Industry Human Resources Council and the American Geological Institute. I would like to thank our co-sponsors for promoting this webinar, the Australian Institute of Geosciences, the Society of Economic Ge Geologists, and the Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada. And at this point, I'm going to turn the slides over to Nell and Lee Sturck, who is the Director of Attraction, Retention, and Transition at the Mining Industry Human Resources Council. Melanie was the driving force in organizing this webinar and pulling together the speakers that we'll be hearing from today. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Melly Sturk. I'm the Director of Attraction, Retention and Transition at the Mining Industry Human Resources Council in Ottawa, Canada. Um, today we have speaking with us uh, Mar Dr. Martha Roberts, who's my colleague here at NIR. She's the Director of Research and she's going to be talking about a new study that we've just developed in partnership with PDAC called Unearthing Possibilities. Before I turn it over to Martha, I'll just introduce the rest of our speakers. Um, talking about mineral exploration, the PDAC and you, is Mr. Scott Jobin Bevins, and he is a PDAC representative and also the director of Clerical Creek International Consulting. We have a small student panel with us today, and welcome students and thank you for joining us. April Bertrand will be talking about her experience in the mining sector as an exploration geologist at Gold Corp Red Lake Mines in Ontario. And Blake Schreiner is an undergraduate student at the University of Saskatchewan, and he's going to be speaking about his career aspirations in the mining sector. I'm going to wrap up today uh, talking about our Explore for More uh, career resources that are available for you to explore more about careers in the mining and exploration sector in Canada. And then we'll wrap it up completely with a panel discussion and a question and answer session. So right now I'm just going to bring up Martha's slide presentation. And I'll ask you to take it away. Thank you, Melanie. As Melanie mentioned, um, I am her colleague here at the Mining Industry Human Resources Council. I'll start with telling you a little bit about who we are and, and where this uh, research initiative came from, and then walk you through some high-level findings of, of what the mineral exploration workforce looks like in Canada, and what we found out about the HR challenges and opportunities that the sector is currently facing. So we are the National HR Council for the Minerals and Metals Sector. We're a research center that is a catalyst for solving the HR challenges in the Canadian minerals and metals industry. We're an independent, not-for-profit group, and um, one of our key mandates is to create national solutions through collaboration and partnerships and synergies. Um, a good chunk of our work revolves around identifying the HR challenges and opportunities for the minerals and metals industry. Now we've done a lot of this work in the mining side or extraction side of the sector and over the last two years um, have undertaken this particular research project to um, identify these challenges uh, exclusively for the minerals exploration sector. The work that we do is divided into three main um, areas of initiative. One where Melanie does um, her research work, the attraction, retention, and transition um, pillar, looks at career awareness and, and diversity programming, um, among other things, for the sector. The skills learning and mobility uh, pillar of work uh, identifies national occupational standards for uh, many of the key occupations in the sector, and it has recently launched a worker certification and training accreditation program uh, for key occupations surface and underground miners and uh, mineral process operators and diamond drillers and drill helpers. Um, the area that I'm working in is the research for industry sustainability area. And in this area, we do uh, labor market analysis and labor market forecasting and what we call sector studies, which are the HR issue studies that I'm going to tell you about the one for the mineral exploration sector today. Unearthing Possibilities was a, a research um, initiative and a report that focused on the challenges for workers who are involved in 
exploring for and evaluating mineral deposits that eventually lead to new mining operations. So as I said, we're, we're isolating the mineral exploration um, element of the sector. It was a two-year project um, that extended from August 2009 to uh, July 2011. It was divided into three main phases of work. The first phase of work was an economic analysis and uh, labor market situational analysis that formed the foundation of telling us what the sector looks like today. And we went into the industry and did some primary research um, in the form of, of questionnaires and focus groups and um, interviews. Got feedback from employers, employees, and students working in the sector um, on what they see as the key HR challenges and issues uh, in the sector. And we did an analysis where we looked at the, the labor market and the labor market demographics and what people were saying in the sector and um, came up with um, a list of what those issues are and then took them to industry and had a roundtable consultation uh, where we started the work of identifying an industry action plan and, and next steps for um, finding solutions to the problems that were uncovered. Um, we have many partners involved in, in doing the work that we do, and it wouldn't have been possible without uh, key ones who are listed here. First and foremost is PDAC, who are our core partners in the project work and it's incredibly supportive of everything that was done. And then also you can see a list of um, the organizations that committee members represented on the steering committee for the project. And, um, it was a, a wide range of, of exploration expertise that went into uh, helping us get to the outcomes that we have. The first step in doing um, work of, of this kind is um, actually a lot more challenging than it might sound um, at the outset, is that defining what we mean by mineral exploration. Um, the, Definition of the sector um, is important in doing a situational analysis um, or a labor market study, but we can access Statistics Canada data. Um, it's all divided into a series of industry and occupational codes. Now for um, the way that, that the sector is divided up under a statistical definition, um, there isn't a clean sector definition at that can that represents mineral exploration. So we went to the work of um, identifying which of the sectors that are um, defined as that can include activities that relate to mineral exploration and piecing together a number of those sectors in our um, data analysis to come up with a, a solid picture of what we call the mineral exploration sector, or what you would understand it to be. Um, Sectors included the, the drilling and drill helpers, um, support services for mining contains a lot of the um, construction and um, um, labor type roles that you see in exploration activity. Um, geophysical surveying and mapping services um, incorporate much of the mapping and, and geosciences. Um, environmental consulting services incorporate um, another group of the geosciences working in the sector. And of course, the testing laboratories were extremely important. <clears throat> the other thing that we do is um, define what are the key occupations in the sector. And as you can see the list that's there, um, the occupations for mineral exploration in Canada include geoscientists and geotechs, mapping and drafting um, experts, finance and construction estimators, and labor and support services groups. So digging into the data uh, that we had with Statistics Canada, we were uh, able to um, look at the 2001 and the 2006 census data and what happened in the interim in between the two census periods, and then project forward to get an estimation of how many people are working in the sector as of 2009-2010. And when we do this, we find that um, in Canada, there are about 25,000 people directly employed in mineral exploration um, activities. Now, there are another subsection of the workforce who might work in mineral exploration, might work in um, oil and gas, or some other um, support activity for another sector. What we did in this study was isolate only the ones who are working directly and predominantly for mineral exploration. 
If you look at an occupational breakdown of who, who these 25,000 people are, we find that over two-thirds of them are geoscientists and geotechnicians. Um, about a third are, are mapping and survey technologists and technicians, and the rest are working in um, financial and investment analysis, construction estimation, and the labor support um, role. The age profile of the sector is um, was actually a surprising finding for us here at NIR. Uh, the mining industry, we've been talking for a number of years about an aging workforce uh, where you would find that most of the individuals in mining are in the 45 to 50 plus um, categories. So you can see in the figure in front of you, um, that's not the case in mineral exploration. Um, there is an aging workforce in mineral exploration, no question. I'm going to break it down by occupation and, and show you that there are some occupations where um, the pattern from mining does hold. But what we did notice here, um, if you look at the, the bottom two um, bars in the graph, that a, a large portion of, of young people are moving into the mineral exploration sector and that we actually outperform all other sectors in Canada for employing youth in mineral exploration. Um, and if you look at this age 35 to 44 uh, bars on the graph, the other thing that, that was a surprising finding for us is that um, we underperform the national labor force in terms of employing people in that middle career, mid-age category of 35 to 44. Um, this led us to... Um, to having some speculation that there might be an issue with something we call mid-career attrition or people starting in the sector in their careers and then dropping out mid-career. Um, talking through the sector, there's also anecdotal evidence about economic downturns and um, professional scientists being discouraged away from the sector back in the 80s, which might, as young people back in the 80s, which would translate into the um, 35 to 44 uh, gap that you're seeing. So we'll come back to that when we talk about what some of the issues were. Looking at an occupational uh, breakdown for the sector, um, and it will be as, come as no surprise to those of you who have been to PDAC convention or, or mineral exploration roundup that uh, the geoscientists and, and geotechnicians and the other physical sciences um, groups in the sector are um, more aged than we find in um, the rest of the mineral exploration and mineral exploration sector, um, and that the youth in the sector tend to be in the um, mapping and and drilling and blasting and mine labor position. Another way we break down the labor market data is to look at the proportion of women employed in mineral exploration. The interesting finding um, that's illustrated on this figure is that women tend to be employed in what you might call the city or office type jobs in mineral exploration and not, um, not as much found in the um, geosciences or, or field work type job, jobs in the sector. And we're going to come back to that when we talk about the issues and challenges um, around the workforce. The other thing that was um, worthy of noting in the, the labor market profiling is that the mineral exploration workforce is a highly educated workforce compared to all other sectors. Um, you know, well over half of the exploration workforce has, a, at minimum, a university level degree um, of some kind. And, you know, when you include the highly skilled geotechnologists, geotechnicians, role for uh, folks coming out of the college and um, system, you're looking at over 75% of the workforce are highly educated, top post-secondary. So we looked at um, um, the findings from the primary research. So this is the consultation with industry and the feedback from employers and folks working in the sector and uh, broke this down into three areas of thinking about the HR challenges. The first is career awareness and attraction. And what we saw here, uh, the main issue was a, a lack of career awareness or general public awareness of the industry. Um, general public just wasn't aware of what mineral exploration was and, and students in schools and, and even as young as grade school um, were not aware of what types of careers that could be had in mineral exploration or um, what types of um, 
of education they might need to um, have those careers. So the industry is doing um, some interesting work already that um, that we hope will continue into the future, and there are rooms um, to um, do more of this to begin early and focus on on children and the students and teachers to um, help educate on future career seekers what their opportunities are. I'm sure Melanie will be talking a little bit about that um, uh, further on. In terms of, of recruitment, um, the key HR issues that we identify, and some of them I've just talked about, is the spending labor pool, particularly in the mid-career um, area. And another thing that, that industry employers said is the job-ready candidates are in short supply. So people are coming out of the school system and, and entering into careers in exploration, but they don't have, a, uh, for example, a solid sense of working in the bush or a sense of safety. Um, they may not have skills in um, Aboriginal community engagement that are important for the sector. Um, so there's work to be done around um, industry and education partnering and cooperating together to make sure that co-op opportunities or work experience programs are there for um, students in the sector so that they are ready when they come into the job. The other um, interesting finding here is that most of the organizations in mineral exploration are uh, what we call micro or small size enterprises. 95% of the companies that work in mineral exploration have a workforce of less than 50 people. Um, the HR solutions for companies of that size are very different than what you would find in large multinational um, employers. So there's work to be done uh, to understand better what the challenges and needs are for small, micro and small size companies in the sector and um, providing those supports for them. The mineral exploration sector is also a highly global um, sector. Um, people working in the sector tend to work uh, around the world. So you can see here, I'm just illustrating that, um, that this lack of um, experience in the sector was very important to em employers and employees. Both of them identified that as a key challenge. So um, work in that area would be um, critical moving forward. The other thing you see is that the groups who are, um, you know, critical occupations that are aging, where we find mid-career attrition and few women working, are also the ones that are very difficult to recruit for, and you're going to see in a second also very difficult to retain. So there's work to be done specifically in the geosciences to understand the needs of the sector. In terms of ret retention, um, there's a cyclical nature to the industry that um, tends to distract people from staying in careers in mineral exploration and uh, um, certainly in the anecdotal evidence we collected um, supported that uh, finding that I, that I spoke of earlier around mid-career attrition of professionals. Um, it may be linked to the cyclical nature of the industry. It could be linked to remote locations and, and work conditions and the types of careers that are available and where people are at mid-career stage, uh, mid-age stage of life in their mid-careers. Um, so work around explore, exploring um, alternate management practices for um, this key group, maybe keeping them during downturns, um, engaging them um, better through the mid-career stages uh, is, is certainly an important thing looking forward. Here I'm showing you a little bit about um, some of the effective retention strategies that um, employers had, and, and a key one to the top few group into um, is uh, a sense of challenge and excitement in their careers. Um, so we have several quotes in the study that are interesting, but um, you know there are other things that can be done. Just a little thing like sending a, an exploration geologist out with their family once they come back from the field, and understanding that there are pressures at home and uh, involved in that. And again, seeing that the geoscientists and the geotechnologists uh, groups are the ones who are particularly susceptible to turnover, they're hard to retain. So a quick recap before I hand the floor over to, um, to Scott to talk a little bit more about his personal experiences in the sector is to just uh, reiterate that there's a, a lack of awareness with young people and, and students coming into the sector about what the opportunities are. The hands-on experience of workers is 
um, important to both the new employees and to the employers who are, are hiring them. And there is an opportunity for more industry education partnerships here. Um, Mid-career attrition of professionals, particularly women, is something that um, we could uh, do some work in to, to support that and, and um, help them stay in the sector with some creative solutions. Um, one thing that I didn't talk about much that you'll see more about in the report is a lack of Aboriginal participation in knowledge worker roles in the sector. There's a real opportunity for um, developing education programs in Aboriginal communities to fill that gap. Um, a high proportion of micro and small sized enterprises with different strategic HR management needs and a, a global talent pool, um, particularly focusing in on foreign credential recognition and supporting a lot of the work that groups like Geosciences Canada are currently engaged in. So if you're looking for a copy of the report, it is newly minted and freshly up on www.near.ca or you can find it at uh, www.miningHRforecast.ca or you can fire me an email or call me anytime. I'm always here to answer questions and talk more about this. Great. Thank you so much, Martha. And we'll definitely, when we post the webinar, um, as you're recording this webinar, we'll post it online. We'll actually post the link to your um, report there as well. So thank you very much. Okay, so what I'm going to do is go ahead and turn the slides over to Scott. Scott, if you're ready, I'll go ahead and give you the presentation. Okay. Um, I'm Scott Joben Bevins, and I'm the uh, president of the Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada, or PDAC, or uh, PDAC. And I can imagine you're all very busy out there, so I do thank you for joining us today. Uh, the PDAC represents the mineral exploration industry in Canada and around the world. Mineral exploration is the front end of mining, and it's the most essential part of the mining cycle. And mining, together with mineral exploration, are Canada's leading global industries. We have more companies working in more countries, and make no mistake about it, Canada is a world leader. So today I'm going to tell you about the importance of Canada's mineral industry and the world of opportunities that exist. We're hoping there will be some questions at the end, so please think about uh, uh, some of the questions you might have uh, as I present to you today. Uh, the presiden presidency position is a volunteer position. Uh, it's a two-year term, and I'm the youngest president that the PDAC has had in their 79-year history. It was founded in 1932. It's a national industry association that promotes the interests of mineral exploration and development in Canada and around the world. We have over 1,100 corporate members that do include major mining companies, but the majority of our members are junior mineral exploration companies. We're approaching about 8,000 individual members, and this includes individual prospectors, geologists, geophysicists, geotechnicians, lawyers, accountants, brokers, and of course the many service and equipment suppliers that support the industry. Of this 8,000 members, we have uh, over 1,000 student members. And we're very proud of the work we've done to attract students to the association and into the industry, having tripled the number of students in our association in just five years. For its first 60 years or so, the PDAC focused on Ontario, then primarily on Canada. But the times have changed, and in the last 10 years or so, as mineral exploration and our Canadian membership have gone global, we too have taken a much greater international presence. We all share the belief that exploration for the mineral deposits of tomorrow is paramount to the future of our industry and to many of the world's economies. The PDAC priorities and activities have also evolved over time, and this is just a snapshot of what the PDAC considers to be the top challenges of our industry in the coming years. There is a lot of work going on in CSR, or Corporate Social Responsibility, and in the PDAC's vision of responsible exploration, CSR refers to an important but complex mix of uh, social and environmental challenges, as well as all the other important health and safety issues. E3 Plus is a, frame, a framework for responsible exploration is the only comprehensive CSR guidance for mineral exploration in the world. It's also the PDAC's most intensive educational program developed to date. Best of all, it's av available free of charge uh, with anyone who registers on the E3 Plus website. Among the others are education, outreach to Aboriginal communities, and of course our student support and programs. The last one, communications and raising public awareness of exploration is surprisingly new. It's already forming a very big part of what we do as we work to clean up the blemished image of mining and exploration in Canada and around the world. 
Perhaps uh, the PDAC is best known for its annual convention held every March in Toronto. It's the world's largest annual mineral industry con conference. In this past March, we had over 27,000 delegates, uh, which was a new record, and we had representation from over 120 countries. Last year, it featured a visit by the then Minister of Mines for Chile, Lawrence Goldborn, and they brought in the Phoenix One rescue capsule. That's what's pic pictured here. I'm sure you'll all recall the dramatic rescue of the 33 Chilean miners in October 2010. It was quite the event and uh, certainly caught the world's attention and thankfully had a positive outcome. The PDAC convention offers excellent networking opportunities and it really is a must attend for anyone considering a career in geosciences and especially mineral exploration. This past year we had uh, about a thousand students at the convention which was another record high. And I could just say that the convention is a heck of a party. And so if you can find time to get there in March, it really makes a big difference, uh, could make a big difference in your career path. And now here are a few facts that show the importance of mining to Canada, and uh, certainly these facts are impressive. In a recent public opinion survey, the PDAC found that a full 96% of Canadians stated that mining is important to the economy, and that includes the two-thirds of Canadians who describe it as very important. We're also pleased to find uh, that just about 14% of Canadians are firmly anti-mining, and that's significantly less than the one in four Canadians, including those who live outside the cities and are closer to mines, who are strongly pro-mining. Uh, mining is also a major contributor to federal and provincial government coffers. A study released by the Mining Association of Canada, or MAC, in August shows the federal and provincial governments pocketed a whopping $8.4 billion from the mining sector in 2010, uh, which would be 5.5 billion if you excluded the oil sands. So as you can see, mining is very important to Canada's economy, and I hope you'll be hearing more about mining from the industry itself rather than just from the critics. The uh, Canadian industry is by far the largest in the world, which you can see here in these numbers. Uh, according to uh, the uh, Metals Economics Group, which is a Canadian-based uh, um, group out of Halifax, Canada is home to more than half of the exploration and mining companies in the world. You'll hear people in the media sometimes saying uh, that Canada lets its major mining companies fall into other hands, foreign hands, but you'll see here that this chart clearly shows a different story. Canada actually has more companies in all three of the size categories than in any other country. And of the world's largest, 69 largest mining companies, 15 of them are from Canada. Well, like I said earlier, mining depends on exploration, and a strong exploration sector builds mining. And that's why Canada is the world's leader in mineral exploration and mining. We have it all. We have good geology, and most importantly, we have robust, high-skilled exploration companies. But we certainly have our problems, and one of these challenges is dealing with the public image problem that mining faces. Mining has become the target of choice by a growing number of anti-mining NGOs and other critics who pass along all sorts of half-truths and misrepresentations about what they claim Canadian companies are doing outside the country. Another problem facing the mineral exploration and mining industry is a growing shortage of smart, hardworking, creative young people who know about the opportunities that mining offers both here and abroad. So not only is a, there a, a looming skill shortage uh, is a big problem in Canada, it's a global issue. And in fact, uh, in their report called Global Business Risk Facing Mining and Metals in 2011-2012, which was released in the summertime, Ernst & Young say the current skills shortage is already the number two challenge facing the global mining and metals industry. And you can see the other challenges that are listed here. So pursuing a, a, a mineral industry related career not only puts you in demand in Canada, it makes you a real hot commodity worldwide. I work with an international geological consulting group, Caracal Creek International Consulting, and we experience daily and firsthand the difficulties in attracting and more importantly retaining young people in the industry and the enormous uh, shortage there is in skilled personnel, namely geologists and geophysicists. As was pointed out uh, by my colleague there, we are a cyclic industry, it's boom and bust, and so by failing to take action to retain personnel during the, the low times or the bust periods, the industry loses its people and the shortage remains and in fact gets worse. Uh, Mir partnered with the PDAC to develop the unearthing possibilities which is, a, as was pointed out, a recently released report analyzing the short and long-term human resources issues facing the Canadian mineral sector. This report identified HR challenges and uh, had grouped them into the, these three main categories. The career awareness and attraction 
is something our industry has always had as an issue uh, when it comes to career awareness and probably more important, the lack of awareness of the industry to the general public. So we need to have improved coordination and cooperation between industry and education in order to develop more opportunities for hands-on experience. It's something our industry and uh, what we see at uh, Caracal Creek is, that is getting proper training, uh, uh, whether it's through tech schools or cooperative programs or field schools. Now, in recruitment, we have had a problem for years, and it's only worsened since the uh, global financial crisis in 2008. Uh, the labor pool is not thinning, it is thin and uh, job-ready candidates are uh, in extreme short supply. Uh, we can look at uh, other areas uh, other areas in industry to try and attract and recruit, uh, and certainly the PDAC looks at the First Nations and Aboriginal opportunity uh, as building in our, to build our future workforce, especially in Canada. Uh, in retention, uh, mineral exploration workers, uh, you know, they're extremely versatile, they're multi-skilled, you can, they can pretty much move into other employment and other sectors. So we have to be uh, really aggressive on figuring out ways to retain our, our people. Uh, employers are seeing a lot of mid-career professionals leaving the sector for other opportunities. And as the global demand increases, workers in this sector can expect increased compensation and increased opportunities for training and advancement. So what that means is you have a fantastic career opportunity getting in mineral exploration. PDAC is doing its part to encourage students to pursue careers in mineral exploration and mining, includes field trip funding, uh, free two-year subscription to the weekly mining journal, which has a price tag usually of $650 US, as well as scholarships, other awards that are shown here. But the two things I want to focus on are the PDAC convention in March in Toronto and the Student Industry Mineral Exploration Workshop, or SIMU, that happens every May in Sudbury. As I mentioned earlier, the convention is a great place to meet and network with professionals working in the industry to get a real sense of what the industry is like, and the PDAC offers funding assistance to come to the actual convention itself, uh, and we also have a deeply discounted student registration rate. For more information about the convention and the ways the PDAC can help you, please check our website and get in touch with Krishana at the PDAC, and I'll give you her information, contact information later. So the uh, SIMU, or Student Industry Mineral Exploration Workshop, was created to give students a technical business and field perspective of the mineral exploration industry, which is not found in the classroom. It's a two-week program run out of uh, Laurentian University in Sudbury, Ontario. And Blake and April, uh, who are joining us today, were both in the SIMU program last year. The program is based on the mineral exploration and mining cycle, and so in the two weeks we cover all aspects of the industry with as many hands-on components as possible. So far, we've had uh, about 125 students come through the program, and we're continuing, continuing to see a growing interest by industry to sponsor this event. Here are some comments from students who have been in the program, and we're very proud of what we've accomplished uh, through this program, but we're especially proud of the students who have participated. We've always had the best of the best attend. So how do you get involved in SIMU? Well, you must be a third or fourth year student in a university geoscience program or, have a, or a final year student in a college geoscience program. You should have a genuine interest in the mineral exploration industry and then applications are sent through departments uh, and department heads in mid-September. Mid and then as, uh, as, uh, as a contact at the PDAC, you can get on, in touch with Krishana here and uh, she'll be certain to help you out. So to summarize, uh, the mineral exploration industry can certainly offer a geoscientist a fun, adventurous, and rewarding career with as much travel as you can handle and the opportunity to have experiences all around the world, not only in geosciences, but with the various cultures and people that you'll meet. It's probably the best job in the world. certainly has been the best job I've ever had, and I actually have had a few, but some people call it a hobby. I've been accused of having a, a hobby, and uh, I tell you, it can be just that much fun. So uh, the PDAC is here to help you. Uh, please get involved with uh, associations like the PDAC and have a look at uh, uh, geosciences as a career. You won't regret it. And uh, one more time, here's Krishana's uh, contact information at the PDAC. And uh, here's my email at the bottom of this uh, wonderful looking photo from uh, working in the field last year. So thanks very much. Uh, I'm uh, looking forward to questions. Thank you very much, Scott. And now we're actually going to move over to our student panel, because um, Blake and April 
Uh, so my name is April. I'm just going to talk, I guess, quickly about my experience so far in mineral exploration. Uh, trying to advance the slides here. There we go. This is me. Uh, <laughs> I'm from Sudbury, Ontario. Uh, I went to school there at Laurentian University and got my honors Bachelor of Science in Earth Science in the geology strain. I'm hoping to go back there for an applied master's in a couple years. Uh, but I'm working now in Red Lake, Ontario at Gold Corp Red Lake Gold Mine. And I uh, kind of came into geology, I guess Martha kind of mentioned this earlier, most of us uh, don't really know what geology is when we're starting out, and I was certainly one of those people. Um, first year university, dropped a couple classes, failed a couple classes, and, uh, and then put through my course calendar. And uh, this is a picture of us here at, at SIMU this year, running around uh, <laughs> some old rose beds uh, in Sudbury. And, I used to do that kind of thing in high school, I guess after school with my buddies. So I was looking through a course calendar and, and, uh, and saw that I could learn a little bit about uh, how things come to be and why mining is the way it is. And I thought maybe it'd be interesting. And I've been hooked ever since. Uh, so as far as my work experience, I worked for the Ontario Ge Geological Survey sorry, uh, from 2008 to 2010 uh, for two field seasons and also uh, doing lab prep, QA, QC, and data entry during the winters. And uh, last summer, I started work with Gold Corp in Red Lake, and I'm back here again now as an exploration geologist. So uh, in 2008 with the OGS, my first job was uh, on a surface drill. We weren't doing mineral exploration. We were um, mapping aquifers, uh, subsurface obviously. But um, it did get me exposed to uh, essentially how drills run, and that's really important for mineral exploration obviously. And I got to start logging some core. So that's kind of a fundamental uh, part of the job of any uh, exploration geo. And that was kind of a segue for me into mineral exploration. Uh, the next summer, I did a, a helicopter lake sediment survey uh, in the Fort Francis area. This is a picture from our, from our chopper. So basically flying around from lake to lake, uh, taking water samples, sediment samples, and then doing geochemistry on these to, uh, to see if we could get any elevated uh, concentrations for gold or other base metals. And then in 2010, I went up to Red Lake. Uh, I was working in regional exploration here, but essentially we were just doing uh, some exploration on, on the actual mine claims. So it's kind of moving to smaller scale exploration, uh, you know, in an, in an area of known mineralization as opposed to trying to identify targets. Um, we're now in an area where we know there's a lot of gold and just trying to uh, use the basics, uh, prospecting, geophysics, and geochemistry and mapping that have been previously done to kind of narrow in on some, some better hits. And now I'm in exploration underground. So this is uh, me at my current job. And uh, all of a sudden, you're not just looking at an outcrop from surface. Uh, it's in 3D all around you. So it's, um, I am really have now focused into to the mine site. And uh, it's, it's been really fun to go from kind of the broadest perspective to, to this small focus. And, and it's really, really fun. Uh, SIMU is probably one of the best things I could have done as far as uh, uh, making myself a, a better geologist and just a lot more open-minded to what goes on with the rest of the industry. Um, for me, there are three parts of the workshop. Uh, the networking aspect of it was absolutely phenomenal. Um, at the PDAC convention, you don't really get a half an hour to chat with Scott Jobin Bevins. Um, and there were so many other important people who were at the workshop. It's just, you know, hearing their stories and, and, and where they came from and how they got there just makes you realize that you really can do anything in this business that you want. Um, we all refined our exploration skills tremendously, I think. Um, everyone who was on the workshop, we came from, from different schools, you know, which have different focuses. And I think this really got us all up to, up to par and on the same page with our geophysics, our geochemistry, our mapping, everything, absolutely. And then, of course, there's the business side of things. Um, you know, in this, uh, in, this, in this industry, we are a business, absolutely. Mineral exploration is a business, and if you can understand the business side of things as well as being a great geologist, then you've really got it made, and you can be an asset to any company. So uh, I guess advice that I might have for any students who are, who are getting into this, um, the PDC and the SEG have been absolutely fantastic for um, helping me to make contacts. I mean, I remember going to my first PDC convention in 2008 and just being so shy and not really wanting to talk to anybody and maybe knowing one person there, but um, at the 2011 
a conference, you know, you can't get across the room in less than half an hour because you just see all your old friends and, and absolutely the doors that it opens for you is just phenomenal. I also, uh, when I was in school, passed up a lot of opportunities that I had to do uh, weekend workshops, uh, take field trips, because it's easy sometimes to say, oh, I can't afford it, or I have too much homework and I just can't make time for this. But the more field trips you go on and the more workshops you do, you realize you're passing up the most valuable opportunities ever. So just take advantage of every possible opportunity you can. And uh, finally, um, the only bad days that I've ever had in the field have been when I had wet feet. So the best advice of all, I would say, is to get a good pair of boots. You know, there's a lot of cedar swamp if you want to work in Ontario. And if you can make it 300 feet past the, the first guy, then you're all the better. So take care of yourselves and enjoy the rest of the webinar. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much, April. I'm going to go ahead and turn the slides over to Blake now. Blake, when you're ready, we'll go ahead and turn them over to you. Good afternoon. I'm Blake Schreiner, student at the University of Saskatchewan. Department of Geological Sciences in the final year of an undergrad degree. The discussion for today is on my experience in personal development while in school and how I feel about what I have learned. Topics for today are my path, Mining Human Resources Virtual Mentorship Program, PDAC CMU, getting involved, where and why. My career path. I chose to pursue a degree in geology at the University of Saskatchewan because of the small town feel, also because it has a solid reputation with a diverse course selection. Initially I was wanting to focus on geochemistry and I didn't really know what in geochemistry, maybe water contaminants, tailings, waste rock management. But after getting involved I learned that uh, I have a true interest in mineral exploration and that I can use my past career experience and geochemistry. Uh, by talking to lots of people, asking lots of questions, reading and attending CMU, I discovered that this career would uh, fulfill what I was looking for. My mentors, uh, I've been, uh, been in the Mining Human Resources uh, virtual mentorship for over a year now. I've had two mentors. Um, Rick Hudson was my first mentor. And uh, the theme of my talk today was uh, inspired by Rick in our second phone discussion. He asked me if I got it. He went on to talk about getting involved with organizations such as PDAC, CIM, and to attend events where industry people would be. Then he asked again, do you get it? And I said, well, I think I know where you're going with this. We talked about resume, interviews, networking, how to... Uh, meet prospective employers, uh, how to get out of your comfort zone most weeks uh, for about a four month duration until I was paired with a new mentor. Uh, Ryan and I were paired in my second semester of the last year and it turned out uh, he was uh, from Saskatoon as well. And uh, we could have some FaceTime over a cup of coffee. We talked about work balance legacy, what sort of path I was looking for and where I wanted to go, uh, taking a job for your risk, what kind of job security did I want, how little could I stomach, kind of like investing. We also talked a bit, uh, bit about office work life, email etiquette and attitude and this was great because Ryan has such a great attitude and approaches situations with such logic. Um, the Mining Human Resources Mentorship what I could say about it, quality people, uh, equips, it equips you with uh, the tools that you need to get the most out of the mentorship, uh, build, builds confidence in talking to professionals, learn about the industry and people in it, helps improve attitude and understanding, and it teaches you life skills, uh, time management. PDAC CMU. I was uh, very fortunate to attend a PDAC Student Industry Mineral Exploration Workshop, which was a defining moment for me in understanding uh, what mineral exploration was all about and the people involved. I was amazed at the organization of the workshop and the professionals involved in teaching us different aspects of mineral exploration. Uh, 
including the Ontario Geological Survey, professors at Laurentian University, Carrico Creek International Consulting, ACA Howe in, in the International. Uh, the list goes on of in industry leaders from geophysics, geochemistry, mapping, and to economics and mineral exploration of the industry. Uh, the workshop was so complete that I walked away knowing how diverse and interesting my future career could be. And uh, this was the defining, defining moment in knowing what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Getting involved in learning. Uh, from my experience, I feel that by doing these things contributed towards my personal development and has better prepared me for future employment. Has given me direction as to where I want to go and what I want to do, uh, such as being a mentor, apply for such events such as PDAC CMU, attend webinars, seminars, short courses, becoming a mentor, becoming a mentee, reading journals, asking questions, getting a summer job, meeting people, and they could be a good comment or a contact. I'd like to thank everybody for um, viewing today. And uh, send a thanks to American Geological Institute, Mining Human Resources, PDAC, and other co-sponsors uh, for making this happen. And a special thanks to the University of Saskatchewan Department of Geology for their Great. Thank you so much, Blake. Um, we're going to go ahead and turn the slides over to Melanie. So, Melanie, when you're ready. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Amy and Blake and Martha and Scott, for sharing with us today, and also for to Leela for setting up this, this webinar. It's much appreciated. Uh, I've really enjoyed listening to Blake and April speak about their experience in the sector. I'm going to wrap up the presentation panel today talking about some career resources that are available uh, to help people explore careers in the industry or for industry uh, professionals to engage more with career seekers. So to reiterate, uh, over about the next 10 years, the mining industry overall will require over 100,000 new hires. So we're looking at significant growth in terms of hiring in the geo and earth sciences as well as other occupations in our sector. And a lot of people don't realize that there are actually over 120 career options in the mining and minerals and industry. So if you look at quickly at our national hiring requirement breakdown for the sector as a whole, you can see the predictions moving forward. And when you look at the replacement requirements, you can see that there is a massive exodus due to retirement of workers. So this is really uh, the crux of the issue in Canada, is these huge retirement rates, as well as the lack of understanding of the sector among career seekers. Now, of course, we, there's, there's a cycle that goes along with mining. We start an exploration development, operations, and, and processing, and then through to closure and site rehabilitation. Through all of these phases of the cycle, there are opportunities for career and geosciences occupations. Canada is very concerned about the impact on the environment and in the communities that they work in. So there's always opportunities for people who have expertise in these areas. You can find all of this information on career awareness on our Explore for More website. The, the URL for this site is www.acareerinmining, all one word, .ca. And here what you'll find are lots of resources to help you navigate the Canadian mining sector. You'll find some career profiles on people who work in the industry. And what you'll read about are the things that they do, what they like about their job, what motivates them, and then they give some advice for other people when they're considering careers in the field, in their occupational field. What people really like to see is our salary range card. Now this is an average range of salaries um, from across Canada for a number of occupations in the sector. Not all 120 are there, but it will still give you a really good idea of how great Canada pays in the mineral and, ex and, and, minerals and mining uh, sector. We also have a video library, so here you can click uh, to learn more um, from people who actually work in the industry from a video uh, section. So you can click through and find out which career you want to learn more about and then listen to the person speak about their experience and see them working in their day-to-day -day occupation. We also have our virtual mind mentor program that Blake spoke about. And this program is 
sponsored currently by BHP Billiton. This program connects post-secondary students who are interested in careers in the mining or minerals industry in Canada with exceptional workers in the industry. Now, we may hook people up depending on occupational category, or we might hook you up based on a profile that talks about your, your special interests, the areas of the country that you might want to work in, or what have you. And right now we have about 100 people in our system and lots of great stories coming out of this where um, students have been given opportunities to attend conferences like PDAC. Um, students and, and mentors are connecting through Skype or being able to meet over dinner and really providing students an excellent exposure to the sector, which we know is important for retention purposes and also for potentially getting job opportunities in the, in the industry moving forward. We have a student job board as well, and in here you can register for free, and mining and exploration companies can do the same thing. Uh, they can post their jobs here for free, and they can look through to see what resumes are available, what students are looking for work, and you can connect together through that site. We're also into uh, social media, and one of these examples is through Facebook. We have a Mining Students of Canada page that is for mining students only. Right now we're running a photo contest where we're asking people to post photos of their experience under a number of categories, including technology, uh, corporate social responsibility, adventure, those kinds of things. And if you post your, your photo, you go into the draw to potentially win a Mountain Equipment Co-op gift card. And if you don't want to post a photo, you can go in and like the pictures. Uh, and the, the person with the most likes on their photo at the end of the month will be the one who received that, that gift card. Um, speakers Bureau. So we also have a Speakers Bureau where um, industry professionals sign up to become speakers and go present to different schools or community groups across the country. We also encourage students who are involved in the sector to join up to be speakers as well. What greater way to hear about the sector as a young person from somebody else who's their peer. And it gives an opportunity to spread the word about careers in mining. We heard from Scott and Martha that there's a serious issue around career awareness and knowing what's available so that you can make, uh, make a range of career or know, know your range of career options to make your choice. So this is an opportunity to spread the word. It's also a good opportunity to volunteer and to build your resume. And all the resources are free. So if you want some experience speaking in public, you want to go out and spread the news about mining and exploration, then here's a good opportunity for you. So in conclusion, uh, before we turn it over to questions and answers, why mining? Why mineral exploration? Why this sector? Uh, we know that Canada is concerned about social and environmental impacts when mining. We know there's great salary and benefits. You get paid well in our sector and you're valued um, as a worker. Excellent technology, the things that you get to work with now, you could potentially be digging at a mine in the Northwest Territories from your office in Toronto. And technology is, is advancing very quickly in the industry. Opportunities for career advancement like never before. Because of this exodus of retiring workers, there's immense opportunities for young people to come into the sector um, who are really uh, keen and want to develop professionally and take on new roles. You get to work as a team in a dynamic working environment and you get to move into different positions in your career if you'd like to. Um, local and rewarding opportunities, and of course you can contribute to local community prosperity. So explore for more. Uh, career in mining really is more than you might think, or more than other people might think. Uh, please send me an email if you have any questions about the resources that I just showed you, and feel free to sign up on our website. Again, it's a careerinmining.ca where you can learn about um, careers in our sector in Canada and getting involved. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Mel. And I'll go ahead and take the slides back. At this point, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and move into our panel discussion. Um, so for all of our participants online, you can go ahead and use your question box to type in your questions, and we'll be taking all of your questions now and be asking them of these speakers. So I'm going to unmute all of the speakers right now. And um, we'll start fielding questions. Um, a couple questions coming in right now, especially for Blake and April specifically. Um, we have a question here saying, what specifically made you take an interest in geology and at what age? 
Uh, Blake, do you want to go ahead there? Yeah, I guess I could. Um, <laughs> this might sound a little bit weird. Like, uh, when I was younger, I was always interested in ex exploring, like, the great explorers of our time have found the corners of this world. But, uh, and then people would say, well, it's all been explored. Everybody, every corner of this planet. Well, that's not true. Uh, I found after, actually, it wasn't until my mid to late 20s that I actually found out, well, I can explore. I could be an exploration. Uh, there's lots that hasn't been found yet. And uh, I'm just really happy that I can use my background. Um, like, I had traveled a little bit to Australia, New Zealand, uh, Hawaii. I've seen a lot of different landscapes. And I've always had a fashion, fascination about what is that, what is that. And uh, that was one of the reasons I went into chemistry, too. I wanted to know how things were put together. And I find that... Um, exploration and geology is just uh, real excellent. It's everything around you, uh, the ground that you walk on, um, to basically parts of your cell phone inside, you know, the metals. So I think that's what attracted me. There's a, it's an exciting, exciting field. Thanks. Yeah, I guess for myself as well, I, I grew up in, uh, in Sudbury, so a mining town, and um, I really, I mean, if you had asked me what geology was, you just think, oh, well, isn't that the people who look at rocks? Or, um, yeah, so, um, but I've always liked to, to just go outside to have fun, right? Like, you're in school all day, so then what do you do after? Go out. And um, I think when I was just kind of looking through my course calendar trying to change programs, uh, you know, a geology course caught my eye because it just said, well, I'll learn how the, how the earth works and whatnot. So uh, I just thought I'd try it out, but... I was hooked like from day one, like you said, Blake. It's it's really the ground that you walk on. It's so interesting, and um, and and now you can explain how it all happens, right? I think um, I don't. I didn't really have even a concept of, of mineral exploration until maybe a year or two after I had gotten into geology too, um, before it really hit home. But it's probably the most exciting field you could be in. I would think for a young person, especially. Great, thanks so much. Um, we have some other questions coming in. Uh, one is, what are the opportunities for a mid-career geologist to enter the job market? It's Scott here. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, so it, it, it's um, a mid-career person who wants to enter uh, our sector, basically. And uh, I think, as we pointed out in the presentations, the opportunities are uh, are there for um, certainly for uh, many different levels of jobs with different skill levels and uh, so it's really a matter of just having the right education that fits the areas of demand uh, but but our certainly one of the one of the things about our industry is it's so multidisciplinary that your training in many other areas can generally be, be applied in our industry at some level and so uh, uh, the opportunities are there at any at any age, really, just or you know any age or any part of your career to switch over to our industry. Um, just a quick question too about um, foreign applicants. Do Canadian mining and mineral exploration companies hire foreign applicants, particularly right out of university? And can you also comment on transfer of licensure, professional licensure? Um, what licenses transfer into Canada or out of Canada as? Uh, mining professionals move around the globe since this is a global industry. Yeah, I can take that one again if you'd like, uh, Scott. Here, uh, our our consulting group. Uh, you know, we've been working to hire and have hired uh, people from outside of Canada to work in Canada for us and on other projects around the world through our Canadian offices. And uh, it can be done. And the licensing of a PN or a or a professional geologist uh, in many jurisdictions can be transferred quickly over to uh, other jurisdictions. There's uh, in Canada, there's each province controls its own um, uh, professional licensing, so there is a bit of paperwork to do and uh, and some qualifications to meet. But for the most part, uh, your professional license to operate is transferable. The most difficult part uh, we always face in Canada is. Uh, 
and making the government understand that the uh, positions of so, you know geologists and geophysicists are actually a position that's in demand, and that we don't have enough Canadians to fill those positions. That we need to be looking abroad, uh, and and that the uh, Immigration Canada needs to make the process a lot easier for us to bring in professionals from outside this country. So that's a bit of a challenge we're facing now, is it, um, explaining how much and just how much in demand uh, uh, geologists are in our workforce. So, so to answer the question, yeah, that's a highly transferable uh, professional licensing. That's for sure. Great. Um, we've got another question here, actually, for April and Blake. Um, can you comment on the technical skills, the technologies that you picked up in university versus the ones that you picked up outside of university, and what would be your um, recommendations for students that are interested in the mineral industry? Like what classes should they take? What things should they pick up to help them prepare from your experience? Well, I have a background for like technology. Wise, I have a background in chemical technology. I did a, a diploma program before this, which works with using uh, X-rays, uh, X-ray fluorescence, XRD, um, all kind of different analytical techniques to um, to determine what composition you have of something. Say, um, for what I've been learning in uh, school here is different technologies, uh, computer applications, uh, say ArcGIS. It's a very, very highly sought out uh, thing to learn in school. So um, that, along with your core geology courses, like uh, say igneous petrology, learn all your petrologies, learn how um, magma evolution happens, learn how uh, metamorphism uh, different minerals change. That'll give you a better understanding about uh, different uh, geotectonic settings around the world, like uh, how different landforms form. Um, and then from there, you can go into how mineral deposits form. Um, it's good to have some, uh, I guess, sedimentary knowledge about uh, processes like that. Um, like I said before, computer programs such as ArcGIS. And uh, yeah, well, I think uh, that's, I'll hand it over to you, April. Sure. Um, I think for myself also, definitely ArcGIS was, uh, that was a class that was taught uh, at Laurentian. So I took that and I found it to be very useful um, or, or other programs similar to that, such as MapInfo. And um, as well, uh, this wasn't offered at Laurentian, but any sort of 3D modeling program, like. Uh, Studio 3 or, or MineCAD, very useful. Uh, if you can if you can get a head start on that while you're in school, if you have any opportunities, it's going to come in very handy once once you get into the workforce. Um, I think things like programs for core logging and things like that you pick up pretty quickly. But as far as uh, ArcGIS and the and the 3D modeling programs, they take a little more more practice. So the more that you do have, the better. And um, as far as other classes, I think. The most useful for me probably so far have been the um, field schools, especially for mapping, um, uh, or deposit models. Obviously, that's uh, <laughs> one of the most important goes without saying. And uh, structural geology, for sure. I think a lot of people uh, tend to shy away from structural geology because it's a pretty difficult class. But um, actually, especially now that I'm working underground and you really kind of uh, see it there in front of you in three dimensions, it makes a lot of sense. and it, it uh, it's it's extremely useful. So I would, if I could go back, I would have paid a lot more attention to structural. <laughs> Thanks. I, I just wanted to add to that too. Um, April, you mentioned field schools, and I think that that's an extremely important aspect of uh, you know your your schooling, and it's something that's getting more and more difficult to to um, to get because most a lot of schools aren't aren't offering enough field school and hands-on training. So really, if you're out there looking to develop a, a career and you have a real interest in it, just go out there on your own. Even pick up a guidebook, go out and look at the rocks, and get get tuned into you know improving your observational skills. Because I mean, geology is an observation science. It's it, it you can describe as long as you can describe things well and properly. 
uh, the interpretation of what you're looking at can come later. So that's that's the skill there that we really need in this industry is good field workers who have good observational skills. So just to add that. Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful. Um, can I have a question here for Martha? Um, Martha, you had talked earlier about opportunities in the finance sector for mineral exploration professionals, and you showed how there was a high percentage of um, that sector that was uh, women. Can you talk a little bit more about opportunities in finance for mineral exploration professionals? What do they need to do to get into the finance sector, and kind of how does that play back into the mineral industry? I might get Scott to jump in here a little bit to the um, specifics about how to get into jobs in, in that side of the sector is a little outside of the scope of what we were doing. But um, certainly the, the labor market data showed that that is something, uh, an area where women have been attracted and have um, planted their careers. So spending time around PDC convention and um, you know, heading into the investors exchange and being on the floor and meeting people and talking with people would be a, a good place to start. Um, and something I didn't didn't highlight, but is definitely in the data when you have a chance to go back through the slide, you'll see that both career seekers and employers, um, regardless of whether you're on the finance or the geosciences or the um, labor side, all said that the best way to find career opportunities in the sector is through that kind of networking. It's who you know and who knows who can help you um, find positions. Um, but in terms of, of, you know, the more specific, Scott, I wonder if you could jump in there. Sure. I think uh, uh, a big part of finding a job in the, in the you know, financial community, whether it's you know, a brokerage firm as an analyst or that sort of thing is, is you know, obviously get your geoscience background well established, try to get some hands-on experience, and then go in and take some business courses, uh, or maybe go right in and take an MBA. Uh, and, uh, and certainly, you'll learn a lot of the, that side of the industry just by osmosis and actually getting a job in that side of the industry. And geologists are in demand um, in, in that side of the industry. They're having a real hard time finding uh, analysts and technical people to review uh, projects for financing and stuff. So it's a great sector to be looking at. Um, but in terms of what you need out of school, I mean, it's really just a good grounding in the geosciences, and then try to get some business courses in and get a get a, which might mean going to night schools or something like that, because that's a problem uh, that we've tried to address with our SIMU program is getting more, uh, you know, of the of, of experience or exposure to the business side of our industry, which most of the Canadian. Uh, post-secondary institutions don't teach or, or even make their students aware of. Uh, so that, that's the advice I'd offer anyway, is uh, get a good grounding in geoscience and take some business courses and then uh, get out there and network, as uh, Mark pointed out, because networking is the key. Um, we've got one other question for you, Martha, as a follow-up. Um, it says, Martha's presentation talked about a lack of women in the mining industry, especially in the field positions. What are the specific challenges for women that seem to keep them from staying in these positions? Um, um, there were a few things that came up, and, and again, these are anecdotal from our, our um, questionnaires and interviews with uh, women working in the sector. Um, so they, they mentioned things like, um, not wanting to be away from home for long periods of time at a certain stage in life. It's not conducive um, to family planning to be on the road like that. So particularly women at the mid-career stage might um, be looking for more opportunities in a urban center or um, you know closer to home. Um, for some women, it's just not their thing to be out in the bush and, and roughing it. You're not wearing stiletto heels out there, so if, if you're not wired for outdoorsy adventure, um, and, and it's okay not to be, it just wouldn't be somewhere where you would go. Um, and that being said, um, there are, I think, a lot of misconceptions that women mm -hmm. have about this sector, so this doesn't really speak to the mid-career attrition problem, but more of the attraction and re recruitment problem uh, that we have with, with women in the sector. Um, more women need to understand that there's a place for them in mining and mineral exploration. 
and that they, they can fit in and that there are creative solutions to things like family planning and the things that Martha mentioned. Um, a report that might be of interest to you is called Ramp Up, and it was put out in partnership between Women in Mining Canada and ourselves, MIHR. And you can find it on our website, so mihr.ca. And again, the name of the report is Ramp Up. And it was really looking at the status of women in the minerals and uh, mining sector and finding out what's happening out there from women themselves who are involved. What, what do their careers look like? What do they love about them? What are they finding challenging? I'll just add one thing to this speaking from experience with our consulting group, which has about 120 geologists worldwide. And half of our workforce is female. And I think that we're seeing obviously an improvement in the number of women in the exploration. It's more to do with that mid-career and sort of retention side. And again, as was pointed out, because of the family planning and, and, and having kids. And it's a, big, it's a big challenge that even our company faces and what we end up having to do many times to retain them is, of course, changing their job description when they return from, uh, from their mat leave. And so they'll go from being, you know, in the field, which they really loved, to mostly working out of the office. And so uh, personally, I, I mean, it's a challenge, but I, I think that we are seeing a lot more women in mineral exploration and that if we can just work to, uh, you know, meet, you know, because we don't want to lose them out of our industry, we want to retain them, it's just working harder to try and accommodate uh, a different world out there now. So. Great, thanks for that. Um, we have a question about networking. So can, especially Blake and April, as well as um, Scott, Melanie, and Martha, um, can you comment on your background with networking, uh, how, how you see it as important to your career, how you developed your own networks, and how you maintain those? I think networking in the mining industry in particular is extremely important. Um, we were mentioning the importance of going to conferences like PDAC, getting involved in programs like the Virtual My Mentor piece. Mining, even though it's global and big companies, um, people tend to know each other. Uh, it's, it's very close-knit. It's almost like a family, when, especially when you're working in a remote location. Um, you're working in a, in a sort of different work environment than maybe most, uh, most other Canadians. So there's sort of a natural um, bond that happens within the industry. And I think that being able to connect with the right people as early as possible and being able to listen and learn from people who have lots of experience is incredibly important in terms of not just finding a job, but making sure that uh, you're successful and your career development goes well. And I'll, I'll add to that um, that in the, in the mineral exploration side of the sector, um, in the large majority of the organizations who would be hiring are micro and small enterprises, and they, and they won't have um, large HR machinery where you submit your resumes and they get filtered and not necessarily going to hire large expensive recruiting companies to help them find workers. So they're, you know, if they're looking for someone, they'll be asking around the floor at PDAC who knows who and who's graduating and who's where. So those networking opportunities are incredibly important in that kind of environment. I wouldn't uh, just put out your hand and say hello, introduce yourselves. The conventions uh, such as PDAC is just great. Like uh, I had met um, April there, and then I met her again at CMU. Um, I met my mentor, um, Rick Hudson, at well PDAC for face to face there, and he introduced me to lots of people. Uh, so the virtual mentorship attending these events and just talk to people. They'll they'll be open to talk to you right away. Thanks. I think Blake, you've hit it right on the head there. You've got to get over your inhibitions and, and sort of shine this out there and, and get a business card and you know make that your calling card and just and just everybody in our industry is approachable. Uh, whether that's a you know a president and CEO or, or another geologist. They all are very open, certainly because number one they're looking for young people to enter our industry. We all recognize how important it is. So that they'll be uh, open to discussions. And if you come to the PDAC, you know, you, uh, you go up to a, a, a company's booth and you just start having a chat, asking them, you know, what do you guys work in? Where are you working? Are you looking for hiring people? That sort of thing. And, and get out to your local, um, you know, if you have a local association chapter or something that you can go to their meetings, 
even if it's an engineering chapter, because you might not have a geological science one in, in your town, you go to that anyway, because there's all sorts of cross uh, connections between um, you know, geophysical associations and engineering associations and, and the geological community. So, uh, like Blake said, just stick your hand out and, uh, and uh, introduce yourself. So. Uh, sure. Uh, the only other thing I was going to add, I guess, which um, <laughs> everyone else has pretty much already talked about, is that um, a PDC, pretty much the convention single-handedly uh, opened me up to networking. And um, and in between the SIMI workshop and that, I, um, you know, you go to the PDC, and this year I think I planned to go to six or seven talks, and I only made two because you just can't get through the convention without seeing all these people that you know, and, and maybe you only met them once at last year's convention, but they still remember you, and, and you chat for 20 minutes, you know? So um, it's it's really great. I think there's nothing else like it, and and uh, and people don't seem to forget each other, so it's really, um, as far as opening doors for future opportunities or, you know, say you have a friend who, who needs a job, somebody that you know is going to know somebody who wants to hire someone else, and, and it's just... Uh, goes on and on and I think it's really it's a positive thing absolutely so we have a question here real quick about um, the mid demographic gap can you talk about um, how industry can basically avoid kind of that mid-age demographic gap in the future or is that going to be something that looks like it'll continue to persist over time it's a, it's a challenge to manage because often that mid-age gap is, uh, I think right now what the numbers are showing is that that happened due to the economic downturn back in the 80s, and I'm sure Martha can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, it, it could be one of the factors. Yeah, yeah. and uh, and so what, what happens there is, is that when commodity prices go down, so do activities in the sector and so does employment as a result. So right now we're working hard to look into that counter cyclical or to that cyclical issue more closely so that we can come up with counter cyclical tactics to manage it. So how do we encourage companies to keep employees on um, even in downturn situations while maintaining their their financial um, stability? And it's a, a really interesting project and there's been some things um, happening in other countries to try to manage this a little bit better. Um, so we're looking forward to digging into that a bit more. Also, I think if you're looking at the attrition that happens uh, maybe because of family planning or um, because, you know, somebody decides they need a career change, I think the, uh, the industry um, is looking to do some more creative things and, and um, you know, to think maybe in a different way than, than it used to think and, and think outside the box in terms of, of coming up with solutions. And I believe that if the industry is more diverse in terms of its workforce, that also creates a better diversity of problem-solving um, techniques. So having women at the table, having Aboriginal people at the table, having new Canadians from a variety of countries at the table to come up with solutions to these, these problems that have um, unfortunately been part of the sector for, uh, you know, in the past. Maybe we can come up with some more creative solutions to dealing with those issues. Uh, it's, uh, I would just add to that 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 gap from 30, I think it's the 35 to 44 age group, um, can be almost directly correlated to the downturn after BREX in 1997, where there was about a five-year hiatus, basically, in mineral exploration, in which uh, there was thousands of geologists without jobs, and uh, many of them just disappeared from the workforce. So uh, it's interesting those, seeing those numbers come up like that. And um, like you said, it's cyclic. But I think the industry itself is its own worst enemy on this, and junior companies are not cash flowers. They are spenders, and they can't afford to keep uh, young people necessarily or any geologists on if, the, if there's a downturn. So in our industry, a big portion of the guilt in not coming to the table on this lies with the major or mid-tier producers, the, the, the companies that are doing very well when, when things go very well. They need to step up. And uh, and make room in their budgets to handle, uh, you know, keeping people on in a downturn. And uh, so I think that's where that's where we could see a big improvement in our industry. Well, that's all of our questions for today's webinar. Um, if you have any questions that were not addressed today, you can definitely email to them to us at workforce at agiweb.org, and we'll make sure to send your questions along to the speakers. 
We'll be posting today's recorded webinar on our GeoWebinar site soon, and that address is posted here at the bottom of the screen. You can visit the website to view this webinar once we get it posted, and as well as previous ones, and check out our schedule for upcoming webinars. Thank you, Melanie and Martha and Scott, April and Blake, for your presentations today. We really appreciate you taking the time to share with us your thoughts and your comments on all the great questions we had. And this concludes our webinar for today.